Okay, we're just going to go for record. Good afternoon. This is Noreen with the Healthy Peaceful Podcast. And today I have a very special guest, Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf. I was introduced to Nancy by a mutual acquaintance, Miriam Hospodar, who wrote the book, Heaven's Banquet. So Nancy, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Well, thanks, Noreen. It's, it's great to be here. Looking yes. Forward. And uh, I became very intrigued by this recent book that you wrote a couple of years ago called The Healthy Brain Solution for Women Over 40, uh, Seven Keys to Staying Sharp on or Off Hormones. So before we get into the meat of it, I'd like you to um, just tell me a little bit about your background. Um, you know, what brought you to this subject, um, your medical career, and you know, just a little bit about um, how you became interested. Well, my background was always interested in the mind. And I guess along with the mind goes the brain. At the time I went to medical school, I thought it was the mind and the body. And that's true too. So I uh, studied psychiatry at Stanford after I graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School. And then I got introduced to Ayurveda, a natural system of medicine from India. And I had already been practicing transcendental meditation for some years before medical school. And it was a savior for me going through that stressful time of medical school and residency. So I had a great appreciation for the mind from that. And I loved Ayurveda because I found, wow, there are things you can do with your daily life and diet and routine that will keep your body healthy, but also, you know, your mind at tip top shape. So and your mo emotions help keep those balanced and keep stress under control. It's like a whole complementary, like 360 approach to your health and well-being. So I, I embraced Ayurveda as part of my, my work and I made it part of my practice. And I had a great opportunity early on to head up the um, Maharishi Ayurveda Medical Center of Washington, D.C., and I began that work in January of, two th of no, 1987, uh, kind of like the, the, the cutting edge of the alternative integrative world. And yet, you know, it was, it was easy enough to do. It was hard to leave my kind of academic track in some ways, but on other ways after I'd done it for two months and I saw people coming back and telling me how much better they felt, I just said, I, I don't care if this doesn't work even in the long run. It's like, this so fulfilling to see people get healthier and feel happier um, just from a couple months. I said, this is, this is worth, this was worth the change. And it, and it worked. It's uh, what, 35 years later <laughs> and I still see patients and, you know, so many people come back just saying, yeah, I'm just so much better. I feel so much better and they look brighter and, and it's, it's very fulfilling. So that's how I got into kind of integrating things. And the whole healthy brain uh, connection came. I think I've had patients in the last 10 years or so. My, my patients have been kind of maturing as I mature. Most of my patients are kind of my peer group. And they have been since I was in my 20s and started my practice and till now. So anyway, people started, some people started to come with memory issues. And sometimes it was easier to solve. Like when they were in their 50s, it was usually a B12 deficiency, or it was maybe they had lead exposure. And I found that in some people and we corrected that and their memory recovered perfectly. But I'd say in the past few years, as people got older and older, the memory problems seemed to be more difficult to turn around, more complex. And when I heard of Dr. Dale Bredesen's work, and also that he was written papers, he had published papers on Ayurveda and mm -hmm. the mind and brain and Ayurvedic herbs and, and his, his work um, had been with Alzheimer's for 30 some years uh, as a researcher. 
basic science researcher. And basically he and his team had all these grants over the decades to study this drug and then that drug and then that drug and that drug and that drug and that drug. And at some point after like 30 years, he just, you know, it was like he, his whole team was getting kind of frustrated. It's like, it all looks good in the lab. And then we put it into, you know, people and it just, it just doesn't really do it. And some of his lab people, you know, team members started coming to him and say, well, look at this, look at this article, Dale, you know, this is on vitamin D, or this is on B12, or this is on, you know, removing toxins, or this is the effects of mold on memory in the brain. And, and it started to look at all that. And finally, uh, and one of his uh, very close colleagues in his research was Indian. And he said, look at what some of the Ayurvedic herbs and knowledge can do for the mind and the brain. And they started to play around with it and see some good results in the lab and see from the research done by other people, well, maybe there's something to this. So, so they got together one day and they put everything they could find on natural approaches to the brain up on the whiteboard, you know, all across the, the room <laughs> and, and said, well, maybe what we need to do is do all of it. You know, basically, maybe we need to just take everything and approach with each person, look at all the things, nutrition, inflammation, toxicity, mold, heavy metals, um, inflammation, the, uh, uh, blood sugar, you know, and stress. And let's look at everything. And maybe if we give people that have memory problems address it all, evaluate them really carefully and see what are their issues and then work with them to correct them naturally. Um, maybe that'll work. Mm. And I don't know, it's one of those things where the universe puts together, you know, funny uh, coincidences. So I didn't know anything about his research until a colleague of mine met with um, a friend, a colleague of Dale Bredesen's. And it was just because she was interested in what we were to doing teaching Ayurveda and, and transcendental meditation research and all that. So this lady met with us and she says, oh, I just have to tell you, my best friend was losing her memory. And she, um, she got on a plane and she flew to Dallas and she got there and she couldn't remember why she was there. Mm. She mm. really couldn't remember it to the point where she got on a plane and flew back to her home on the East Coast. And when she got back, there was a message on her machine that was like eight or nine, nine years ago. Um, uh, and it, it said, hey, you know, where are you? We were supposed to meet. And then she remembered, oh yeah, I was supposed to meet that person. That's why I flew to Dallas. And then she realized she was really having a problem. And she was somebody who knew seven languages, was a consultant, flew all over the world, did projects and all over, and you know, wrote long reports and complicated project analyses and all that. And she said she was to the point that she was like uh, mid, like in her later half of her 60s, she got to the point where she said she could not put together a grocery list let alone write a complex report. Mm -hmm. And she was getting her kids' names mixed up with her pets' names. And she, she was just going downhill. And unfortunately, her mother had had Alzheimer's. And she said, and she had cared for her for like 10 to 15 years before she passed away. And she said, I'm not going to go through that. And she called her friend and she just said, I just want you to know that I'm going, you know, I, you're my best friend. I'm just telling you, I'm going to take my life because I've got this disease and I'm not going to go through what my mother went through and I'm not going to put my family through it. And so her friend told us at the dinner, she says, so I said, well, wait, I have a colleague who's been researching Alzheimer's and memory and he has a new approach and it's totally on the level of research, but you know, why don't you go fly out and talk to him? I'll, I'll, I'll get you together. So she got her best friend together with Dr. Bredesen. And he said to her, well, look, I haven't, I haven't been able to get a grant for this. So I haven't studied it, but you know, there's some research on these natural products and such that show it might help. And I, I think it could work. She says, I'm all in, just tell me what to do. I'll do mm -hmm. everything. 
you know, what did she have to lose her life? She had already decided her life wasn't worth living. So she had all this comprehensive blood work and tested out all her vitamins and her hormones. And she had, she had actually learned transcendental meditation years before, but she got so busy that she stopped doing it. And then she thought she could live on five hours of sleep. And then she had gotten away from taking her hormones, which she'd been doing since menopause, just because she was so busy, everything, all her self-care had fallen apart. Sure. So she put it all back together according to his, you know, evaluation. And then she started yoga and she, she said yoga was a really important component. She actually did so much yoga that the teacher said, why don't you become a yoga teacher? <laughs> and so that was part of her therapy was learning how to teach yoga. And she said after about two to three years, she was recovered enough that she went back to academic teaching. She mm. taught at a university in New York mm. until last year. Now she, she retired from that so she could work on finishing her book, which she's writing about her history and to inspire other people. And she's great. She actually is a coach for me in my practice. She coaches um, some of my patients who are having memory issues. That's great. And, it, so. and is she, uh, what Dale Bredesen refers to in his book, The End of Alzheimer's, um, is she the patient zero? She's absolutely patient zero. Okay. Yeah, Kristen, patient zero. Yes. Yeah, and she's kind of come out of the closet because she said, this is what I'm going to do now with my life. I'm going to coach other people. I'm going to write my book. And I really want people to know that it's possible. It's possible to turn this around. That's awesome. And, She's eight years out or maybe going eight and a half going on nine years now. And she's like sharp as a tack. Yeah. Wow. What, a, what an inspiring story. So you, my understanding is that you trained in Dale Bredesen's recode protocol. Yes. And that's kind of the second part. Well, I, I was sitting there at this dinner and I thought, wow, you know, my jaw was probably dropped and I was like, wow, that's an amazing story. But part of my doctor mind said, well, that's really great, but I don't know anything about this and there's no research yet on it. So I, I don't know, how, you know, it doesn't really benefit my patients because I don't know how to implement something like this. Mm -hmm. So then about four or five or six months later, all of a sudden I found out from a friend of mine, a colleague friend that the same one who was, had been at the table that he was going to a weekend training with Dr. Bredesen at the Institute of Functional Medicine, like three days later, and he was gonna train in this. And I said, well, I wanna train in this too. <laughs> you know, I said, I'll, I'm gonna be there. You know, I just immediately changed my plans. And I was there with my friend uh, for, the, for that first weekend, um, that intensive training that we did. And, um, that was really transformative. And I came out of that and I was so inspired that I, I, uh, I immediately created an online course called My Ageless Brain, mm -hmm. which I gave live and people can still take it now. They can go to myagelessbrain.com and, you know, sign up and take a course with lots and lots of, you know, presentations and handouts and kind of leading people step by step. Cause I said, I got to share this. You know, I had like 250 people on my first course and walking them wow. through the steps of how do you get your inflammation under control? You know, how do you sure. address hormones and, and the whole thing. So, uh, and you've also shared it by, by writing, writing your book, of course. Well, yes, thank you. Um, it was about a year later, I would say, or later that year, I, I came across the research of Lisa Moscone. And she researched women versus men going through midlife. Mm -hmm. and looked at their um, fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is like um, looking at the blood flow in the brain, which indicates the metabolism of different parts of the brain. And that's a, one marker of health and health and vitality of the brain cells and memory. And she looked at it um, along with verbal memory abilities. And she saw that at about age 40, the men she tested and the women were about the same. In fact, the women had a little more metabolism up in the brain, probably because, you know, we're big multitaskers and, and all that. So, and the verbal memory was even a little better for the women. But then as women went through their 40s, she saw that there was a big drop off 
she didn't follow the same women. It wasn't longitudinal. It was slices. Okay, now I'm going to take women who are 45 and women who are 48 and women 50 and study them. And what she found when you look over time was that that metabolism, that really healthy metabolism in the brain dropped off quite dramatically over Mm -hmm. that decade. And, and even into, you know, the first years post-menopause and the men's did not change. You could barely see any change. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I said, women have to learn about this. They have to take action when they're 40, not when they're 55 or even worse, 75 is kind of the cutoff. Like once you're 75, there are people who get better after that age. Like I had a patient who was just turning 80 and she turned her, her severe memory loss. It was starting to become quite severe. She couldn't recognize people in the store that were people that in her life. Um, But she turned it around in a few months by applying all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she was also a long time meditator and yoga practitioner. And, you know, she had kind of a good foundation. But I have quite a few people who come to me, you know, who are 75 and 76 or 78. And it's it's a lot harder to turn around. It's not it's not as um, it's not as high a proportion of people who get this kind of miraculous turnaround. Um, So we don't see wait. Start early, start early and try to avoid that, that loss of function that can occur during, I think it's, you know, probably the perimenopause puts a big wrench in women's, you know, physiology, big hormonal changes, and those big hormonal changes stress, stress the brain and withdrawal of estrogen, withdrawal of estrogen, um, estrogen is a very big growth promoter for brain cells. And it helps keep the arteries healthy. Yeah. So would you say that the decade between 45 and 55 is a very critical time period for women in terms of brain health? Yeah. In fact, it's funny because Ayurveda says 45 to 55 is the most important decade. It creates the foundation of your later health. And certainly now we're seeing some of the evidence of that with brain health. And Mm -hmm. so the recommendation is to... uh, Start at age 40 and really evaluate yourself fully, Uh, check all your hormones and your nutrition and your lifestyle and get it all balanced. For one thing, you'll probably go through perimenopause and menopause a lot more smoothly. Yes. And secondly, probably you'll maintain a healthier hormonal strength and balance that will help protect your brain and probably, you know, sleep disturbance from lots of hot flashes. Mm-hmm. That's probably one of the a major contributor to uh, brain decline. Although we don't really know for sure um, what the causes are, you know, we just- Yeah, know. that's, 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 uh, well, that's uh, quite an introduction. So um, I have some specific questions, but that's wonderful. It's very important. Um, I know you said that um, Alzheimer's in the U.S. is the third leading cause of death um, for women. So that was that's probably not a statistic that many women are thinking about in terms of um, you know they're aging gracefully. Um, I know I was not aware of that that Alzheimer's or cognitive decline is really the third leading cause of death. Yeah, for women is like the sixth leading cause for the for the country. And in the United Kingdom, it is number one cause of death. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I saw that I saw that the UK was was even higher than the US. Yeah, I don't know why, but, but and two thirds of the women, uh, two thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women. So again, it makes you wonder, you know, that or think that probably the hormonal something hormonal must be, you know, involved and not that hormones are bad because, you know, up until menopause, women are doing fine with that. Sure. We're on, we're in an even par with men. And then with the hormonal changes, there's a, there's um, a significant change or disparity between men and women. Yeah. And now without, without taking these um, without taking action, of course. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, that's a, a really good point, Noreen. It's like this can be prevented. Sure. 
it's not it's not the way we're meant to go like we're not meant to just deteriorate after menopause yeah yeah I think I think I think that's the silver lining is that um it it is something we need to attend to uh and not ignore you know um now I know that there isn't any any real um definitive um research indicating the causes of Alzheimer's. I mean, there's um, a, a lot of discussion about the amyloid. Too, it, it's sort of like the too much or too little. Um, and, and then these um, particular tangles, but so it's not, you, you know, in Ayurveda, um, there's um, a lot of discussion about, you know, it's, it's important to get to the cause. And with Alzheimer's, it's, it, there's, there doesn't seem to be a single cause. Um, and I know that Dale Bredesen in his book talked about the 36 holes in the roof um, and that you're trying to you know, patch these holes. Um, and do you wanna talk a little bit about that in terms of, and really looking at the discovery that Alzheimer's really is a multifaceted um, disease and a multifaceted approach is required. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the 36 holes in the roof are what he is, he and his team have identified, you know, so far the number of pathways, uh, in the brain that are influenced by Alzheimer's or that may be causative, you know, when they start to break down and, um, he said that for, you know, the, the, what they found so far, and I would concur with my experience with many dozen patients, is that um, most patients have at least like 10 to 15 different issues that you have to correct before they get better. So it's not at this age or that level of decline, it's not the simple, as I said, like a B12 deficiency just or just, oh, we found lead, you know, get rid of it, you're fine. So often it's a multifactorial thing, um, but each, each one of them may contribute in different ways. And the idea that amyloid, this abnormal protein that gets laid down in the brain, it gets laid down between the cells, um, that it's the cause of Alzheimer's. Well, they've done so much research on it and even research that on drugs that get rid of amyloid in the brain. Yes, I read that. Yeah. Yeah. And they find that people can get even worse. Sure. So it's not like the amyloid is the cause, but it's probably, um, you know, some of his research and other researchers now are indicating they think that amyloid is really a protective sign. It's a protective substance. It's a sign that the brain has shifted to uh, laying down this protein, which in some ways can sequester uh, a bacteria or a virus that otherwise might damage the brain cells. So it's, it's, it's okay in small amounts, but if it's in large amounts, it means the, the attack on the brain is coming from too many directions or too intensely. So brain's having to protect, protect, protect. And in that it's laying down all this amyloid and it's causing cells also to start to decline their, or, or pull back their, or lose their connection. So the whole thing starts deteriorating, but so the idea is to shift it, get rid of the challenges, whether it's a, you know, if it's a virus, suppress the virus, you know, with an antiviral, if you have to, like if somebody has herpes uh, simplex that might be in the brain, or if they're exposed to mold, you've got to get them out of the moldy environment because mold can be extremely inflammatory when you're breathing the mycotoxins or even, you know, spores or, or portions of spores breathing them in the nose, it can create inflammation in the brain. Sure, sure. Yeah, so there are all these different things. Yeah, yeah. And I know that um, in your uh, series that you have on the healthy brain, that you really look at this on a month by month basis, uh, and encourage people to do that. And that this really starts out as a seven month protocol, but really, it's a it's a lifetime protocol. Um, yeah, we just kind of try to introduce things one at a time. So yes, they can integrate those things in their life before they try the next. Thing. Yeah, I like that. I like that you're laying the foundation. Um, I'd like to just go through it month by month, just in terms of because this really uh, lines up really with your book. Um, 
And month one, you suggest what you call, um, and Dale Bredesen uses this term as well, uh, the cognoscopy. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about month one and what you think is important. And this is really an assessment. It's an assessment, right. Um, yeah, it comes from a, a term that I believe Bredesen coined himself. He's, he likes to say, you know, at age 50, everybody is supposed to get a colonoscopy, at least that's mm -hmm. the U.S. norm. And so he said, well, at age 40, everyone should have a cognoscopy. In other words, do some formal testing of your memory, even if it's just, uh, you know, some kind of testing with your doctor for 15 minutes. Um, do a range of blood tests and look, do you have in your blood, is it showing that you have a lot of inflammation? Uh, do some really drill down study on your blood sugar handling, you know, beyond just your fasting blood sugar even beyond your A1C, which is an average blood sugar over a couple months, you actually look at your fasting insulin and you can see the earliest signs of your body becoming insulin resistant by checking the fasting insulin. So if you're good on all those three, you know your diet's probably, if your diet's pretty healthy, you can probably continue. But if your diet's not healthy, well, you're lucky so far, but you're probably going to drive that, you know, in the bad direction. And if it's not good, then you really have to cut back on carbs. And there are a number of ways to do that, but certainly cutting out anything with added sugar and, and just going for all whole foods and lots of vegetables and all that. And mm -hmm. then there are things, you know, even going keto, you know, where you're sure. trying to stay in ketosis, that's a way to help the brain recover. If somebody's really having memory problems, that can be a very valuable uh, practice. For yeah, practice. I know that you mentioned the uh, 312 rule with fasting. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's also in uh, Dale Bredesen's book as well. Um, so talk a little bit about what that is and why that's important. Yeah, it's been, it's been found in general that people who do fasting on some kind of schedule, even once a month for a few days, or they just have water or something, or they do one day a week, or, or they do um, just every day, they have a, a long time where they're not eating any calories. And a long time means at least 12 hours and for some people, if they have certain genetic tendencies for Alzheimer's, they may wanna have 14 or 16 hours that they don't eat calories. They're, they drink water or something, but they don't consume food. So the value in that is that these extended periods without bringing food in at least 12 hours. So that's just like finishing your evening meal by seven and then don't have breakfast until seven. It can be that simple. Mm -hmm. uh, that you give the brain time to shift into uh, burning ketones, which are byproducts of fat. So the brain is like a hybrid car, you know, it's like a Prius. It can burn either gas, which is kind of polluting and, and as it uses oxidation. And that's like burning, that's burning sugar, basically. Our brain will preferentially burn sugar, blood sugar. And secondly, the clean fuel is ketones from fat breakdown. And so if you go long enough without eating, the brain runs out of available carbs and sugar and it just shifts over and it starts burning ketones, which is a very clean fuel. And that allows a lot of restorative processes in the brain. So we wanna have at least a few hours of that in every 24 hour cycle. So having that at least 12 hours from dinner to breakfast um, or 14 or 16 even, um, that gives more time for this uh, re repairing that's going on. And at least three hours before um, eating, eating in bedtime, I think that was the other recommendation. Yeah, that's the three part of the three slash 12 rule. Sure. And I loved hearing this because Ayurveda has, you know, preached forever that you should uh, eat your dinner by seven, go to bed by 10 and right, don't right. Eat solid food after seven, you know, sure. water or something. So uh, it's basically the same kind of thing. And the yeah. Idea, yeah, the idea is Ayurveda has been saying that in the evening at 10 o'clock at night, 
your not only your brain, but your whole body metabolism shifts into a purification mode. Yeah. It, it metabolizes waste left over from the day. And with that, it eliminates and helps, you know, get some, shoots them out to the bloodstream and then they go into the digestive tract. And that's why in the morning, it's most natural time to have a bowel movement. Like the whole system is cleansed by the time you start your day. Mm-hmm. And three hours allows that cleansing to happen because there's a 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. cycle. If you eat a bunch of food at nine o'clock at night, your body is actually, your liver and your digestive system is in a, a taking in mode not an eliminating mode. So you're interfering with what's trying to happen naturally. So you're interfering with your cleansing, which means you're gonna build up more metabolic waste over time. Sure. And Ayurveda calls that ama. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's funny that, uh, you know, so is it, is it, is the <laughs> Yeah, is it, is it Western medicine validating Ayurveda or Ayurveda validating Western medicine or in, somewhere in between? Well, Ayurveda came first. <laughs> yes, of course. I think somehow I think that, you know, the, the great rishis or the, the, the <laughs> those who were, you know, deep in meditation and Ayurveda says they cognize the rules of Ayurveda sure. or it was just the doctors and the great Ayurvedic physicians, you know, they figured these things out and they made it part of their code of behavior for yeah. health. But that's 5,000 years old. But today, you know, of the last 25 years, there's been tremendous amount of research on what's called chronobiology, time, the biology of time. Right. And yes, indeed, they're finding that they're, that the body goes into basically a cleansing mode at night. Mm-hmm. And even now, they've discovered that the brain, the brain basically kind of shrinks down so that the spaces between the cells increases during the night. And, and basically the brain flushes itself at night. It flushes out impurities. It flushes out waste from metabolism from the day. It, it is, it's lymphatic system actually kind of dilates and it flushes itself out. Yeah. So again, if you ate a whole bunch of food and the brain's trying to take in stuff, it's probably going to inhibit that process. So, you know, sure, the, sure. Like your body heal itself every day is to follow this 12-3. Yeah, rule. yeah, that's... that's um very practical. Um, so the first month you're essentially suggesting that people do the assessment, you know, find out what's going on, have these tests. And there's lots of places where they can get these lab tests. Um, and the second month, um, you talk about inflammation and the importance, I mean, especially in the last year, but even before COVID, um, you know, we, we hear a lot about inflammation and um, specifically you call the second key to keeping your brain sharp, um, balancing your inflammatory response. So could you talk a little bit about that as it relates to brain health? Yes, this, um, there are different forms of inflammation. Inflammation is like an activation of the immune system. And there are different ways to test for it that uh, will find different kind of parts of our immune system that are maybe overactive. And there's a common one called the CRP, which is C-reactive protein. It goes up in the blood when there's inflammation or the immune system's kind of activated. It will go up if we're fighting an infection but it will also be up just if we're not eating a good diet. And that's the most common result I see of people eating, you know, fast food or lots of chips or lots of sweets, white flour, uh, fried foods. They have an elevated CRP. And this, this indicates that in their blood, actually, they've got a lot of inflammatory activity. And that number one, that's gonna help affect their arteries. And I have to say, you know, Alzheimer's or vascular dementia looks just very similar to Alzheimer's. It's it's just basically the same. People lose their memory. They lose their ability to function in their life. And vascular um, uh, dementia is hard to turn around uh, because once those arteries are clogged, it's, it's quite a process. You know, they're clogged to the point the brain's not functioning. There's a lot of clogging. So you want to prevent that. So again, if you see that on your blood report when you're 40 or 50, you go, or even 60, you go, 
I better turn that around. It's really time to change my diet because I'm, I'm heading down the wrong path. Sure. Um, get cardiovascular disease. I might get dementia and it's a risk factor for cancer and all of that. So, yeah. Inflammation is, uh, is, is, um, negative on all counts. I mean, uh, in terms of chronic disease. Um, so if somebody is, um, if their inflammation is high, um, what, what lifestyle, what things are they going to implement to get it under control? Well, I, I have to say, usually it is coming from their diet. Sure. So really, so diet's really number one. Yeah. And you know, you can make a huge impact most people on their CRP by simply following the basic guidelines that everybody knows we could say them in our sleep, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, have, you know, five to 10 fruits and vegetables a day and mm -hmm. cut out refined sugar and cut out white flour. And maybe for some people it's cut out gluten, which can be a big inflammation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, cut out fried foods and fast foods and prepared processed stuff that, you know, chips and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, eat whole foods, you know, yeah. eat, eat, eat nuts, eat, um, you know, a snack of fresh fruit, just the seeds. There's, there's all sorts of things to eat. That sure. So mostly whole food, plant-based, um, yeah, exactly. and, uh, healthy oils and, um, um, I know you also recommend um, meditation and other ways to manage looking at your stress levels, uh, right. daily exercise, morning walk uh, is something that um, you mentioned several times in both on your, I think on your website and your book. Um, so just the importance of getting moving. Um, uh, and the morning, interestingly, if you're working on your weight, the body mass index and in people who get at least 20 minutes of outdoor light in the morning before noon, even without walking, their body mass index is significantly less, even if they consume the same number of calories as other people and their sleep is uh, controlled for. So there seems to be something about light that influences beneficially our metabolism. Yeah, wonderful. And um, month three is healing your gut. Um, and, uh, when you heal your gut, you get a better brain. We hear a lot about the microbiome. And of course, I, I believe Ayurveda, um, is very, has always emphasized digestion, um, as very important to your overall health. Really, it starts, everything seems to start with digestion. So, um, any suggestions about healing your gut and, and how that relates, you know, we have the gut brain connection, uh, which we read about, uh, maybe speak a little bit about that. What we, what we should be thinking about in terms of healing our gut. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the gut has deteriorated a lot in the last decades. I see so many more people, even very young people with lots of gut issues that mm -hmm. weren't there before. Yeah. I think, you know, between diet and maybe GMO foods and just uh, increased stress at early ages that the gut has taken a beating. So when I, in my practice, what I do is if somebody has complaints of the gas or bloating or reflux or constipation, all these things, I do take, um, I do take their pulse. That's the Ayurvedic way of checking what's going on with their nervous system? Is it a stress related? How much is stress contributing? How yeah. much emotional upset or stress con contributing? Uh, how much is maybe kind of irregular lifestyle contributing? You can see all these things in the pulse, okay. maybe diet and, and bad food that even shows in the pulse. So when you go to the Ayurvedic doctor, you can't hide your diet. You can lock on your <laughs> form, but they're going to tell when they take the pulse. Um, uh, so by taking the pulse, you can actually, are you able to, to really evaluate the tenor of the diet? Yeah, pretty much. If people are eating, you know, just too heavy food and at night you feel certain things called ama in the pulse is very heavy and dull and covered. And if they're eating a lot of toxic foods, like all the fried foods and, and hot, maybe, you know, processed foods and stuff, you'll feel the 
the liver aggravated and the blood system kind of irritated. You'll feel the inflammation. There's a number of times I've taken someone's pulse and I said, you know, what are you eating? Um, even people that I thought it even looked good on their paper. And I said, well, yeah, I eat Ayurvedically. I said, really? I said, well, yeah, but we've been eating in restaurants the last three months. And I said, well, sure. like, yeah, you know, they're not, they're not good, healthy restaurants. I'm sorry, you're eating vegetarian. It looks good on paper, but you're going to have to cook your own food for a while. And let's see if you can feel better. And indeed, it turns them around. So yes, you can see a lot in, and you can also see, um, we call it doshas in Ayurveda, you know, the effect of the nervous system being out of balance or the acids and enzymes being out of balance or the um, peristalsis flow or um, the lubrication of the gut and the, and the gut microbiome, we can see those things in the pulse or indications of them. We can see what categories of imbalance are there and it kind of guides me in you know, giving them the, the diet that's customized for them. And often we can turn, I say you know, two thirds of the time or half the time, depending on the age of the person and the, the depth of the problem, we can turn around digestive problems in a few months with just the Ayurvedic knowledge and, and matching the diet and the herbs and the lifestyle and the drinks and whatever to their body type or their what's out, out of balance in their pulse to rebalance their digestion. So that usually works. So healing but, the microbiome in terms of um, looking at an Ayurvedic approach in terms of, um, and then having a corresponding uh, benefit to the brain, uh, right. your, your experience is that's fairly easy to, to address. Yes, it is. I most, mean, so it takes clients. time. It takes of course, time. Yeah. I have patients who didn't know anything about Ayurveda when they came in. Sure. Maybe they had chronic burping or chronic gas. And, and, you know, we work through it and they, they get over it. It might okay. take a month. I also do, I also do testing oftentimes. And we look at what's, what's the balance of good bacteria, bad bacteria, any yeast overgrowth or any uh, parasites sure. so that we do look, you know, objectively, we can also see the enzyme production. We can see if there's, um, you know, the pH of the gut, and whether they're breaking down carbs okay or breaking down fat and absorbing it okay. So we can get like a very comprehensive view objectively as well, which can be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and there's an emphasis, it seems to be on, um, well, we talked about the keto ketogenesis in terms of the 12-3 rule in the fat intermittent fasting. Um, but also, um, you know, there's been a lot of attention with the, the, um, ketogenic diet. What is your feeling about that? Um, I think it's right for some people, at least for a, a period of time. Right. I, I don't know about the really, really long term. I don't think they've studied it for a decade yet. You sure. know, I have yeah. a feeling that some people are going, you know, there's some risk of being deficient maybe in certain fiber or certain nutrients or antioxidants, or it's yeah. possible that when, you know, when you quite severely limit the diet, you can over time accumulate some kind of imbalance or deficiency. And I've seen it a lot in my practice because sure. I have a lot of patients, you know, who've been vegan or vegetarian for decades. And I see what kinds of uh, deficiencies and imbalances can come if they're not really careful or if they become too restrictive. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to be um, more moderate in your approach. Um, I, I would just say, yeah, I, I treat it like a medicine. Yeah. So if somebody really has a really losing, you know, severe memory issue, you know, that may be part of what we do for some time and sure, see how sure. they do with it. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that. It's, uh, it, it may not necessarily be a long term, but short term, you're, you're, you're going to test it, especially if they have, um, depending on the severity of the problem. Um, and I know you, you also look at blood sugar in terms of month four. Um, you really want to emphasize with your clients, your patients, that um, they optimize their blood sugar levels. And I know that, um, uh, Alzheimer's, I think has been referred to as type three diabetes or, you know, so tell me the relation there, how that, you know, why is that important? 
Yeah, diabetes of the brain is another term for Alzheimer's. Been yeah. called. And yeah. it's important because too much sugar can activate more amyloid production. Okay. Um, and also when actually insulin, everybody's familiar with the term, but insulin actually causes sugar to go into the cells. So out of the bloodstream, you know, you, you eat something, the blood sugar, you know, you get breakdown of carbohydrate, it goes across the stomach or intestinal lining goes into your bloodstream and it results in the blood sugar going up and your cells then take the sugar in and burn it ideally, mm -hmm. right? Um, if there's too much, then it stores it as fat. But there's a point if somebody is inundating or overloading their body and their cells with carbs that become blood sugar, the cells at some point go like enough already, you know, I don't need any more sugar, I'm, I'm plump up with triglycerides or with fats, and I don't want to take in any more sugar. So the cell becomes resistant, what we call resistant to insulin. Right. And that's when the blood sugar starts going up because the cells are not taking it in. Right, and, right. And therefore, a person starts getting prediabetes and diabetes. And so the sugar itself isn't good for the brain in excess, but there's another factor is that insulin is actually a growth factor for the brain. And the brain mm -hmm. is nourished from insulin. But if the brain cells become resistant to insulin, they also become resistant to its beneficial like growth promoting effect. They're not being properly nourished. Yeah, and that, okay. that insulin is, is one of many brain growth factors, we call mm, them. Okay. So it's an important one and then the brain gets deprived of that. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, um, you also in uh, month five, nutrient deficiencies. So deficiencies in nutrients and minerals, vitamins and minerals. Uh, do you find that most of your pa patients with uh, mild cognitive decline or um, early Alzheimer's, pre-dementia, are you finding there are nutrient and vitamin deficiencies? Um, often there are. Uh, yeah. It kind of depends on how much they've been keeping up with certain things with their, you know, their primary care doctor. Like sure. um, almost everybody is low in vitamin D unless they're taking it. Yeah these days and it's important it's actually a hormone and it's it's very important for the brain and the immune system also um i did mention a couple times vitamin b12 and i do want to bring that up again because especially for vegans and vegetarians uh lack of b12 is can be devastating for the nervous system and the brain and i've had uh, so many patients over the years present with a wide variety of symptoms and we discovered B12 was the cause, you know, from numbness in the toes or tingling sensations where a patient of mine thought she had MS like her brother and it was just B12 to memory problems to depression can present uh, from B12 deficiency. So there, there are a variety of things. So mm -hmm. you, you just have to stay on top of your B12 and it's really not adequate to just be at the level that they say is the the bottom norm of like 200 ish, mm -hmm. it really should be over 400 or to be safe over 500. Yeah. And then you know that your all your reserves are built up in your body and, and you've got plenty, but if you're below 400, for sure, you can be deficient. Okay, great. Uh, hormones. I know that that can be controversial and, and we, we, you started at the beginning of our um, podcast, just talking about um, that critical decade between 45 and 55 for women uh, in terms of the hormonal changes. Um, and um, you, in your book, uh, you're neither um, embracing hormones nor repelling them. You're, you're considering them, you know, I, I'm speaking to having hormone replacement therapy, not the traditional but bioidentical hormones that, um, it is important that you indicated that women have their hormones tested and um, talk a little bit about women's, the changing hormones, that period of life, um, whether depending on the level of hormones, whether bioidentical hormones should be considered for how long, maybe there isn't really one size fits all approach. 
Yes, good point. Um, that's my opinion, actually, with all of this for the brain, but also my whole practice for all these years has been that there's no one size fits all approach. And Ayurveda is a, a fantastic uh, source of knowledge to apply uh, to each individual, understand them and their unique needs. So we start always with Ayurveda. But um, again, we complement with objective tests, like very thorough hormone testing. And it's been very interesting to see that, say women, let's talk about women maybe in around 65, you know, 55 uh, women, maybe five years out from menopause, or they're still menstruating a few people, you know, but they, their, their hormones usually aren't really low yet because hormones during perimenopause, say 40, 40 to 50, 55, they're, they can be quite fluctuating, especially a year or so that we say is perimenopause, like around the time your periods are stopping and maybe they're getting really chaotic or erratic before that. Um, during that time, you know, even estrogen can surge up and down. But once, it, once the periods stop, it tends to be more stable and it, it, it tends to drop off and continue to drop off in the postmenopausal years. So just for example, when a woman's menstruating, you know, her estradiol can be in the hundreds during ovulation and maybe it's down, you know, to, I don't know, 20 or 15 or lower at certain times of her cycle. So there's a big variation, but it's very regular. But after menopause, I would say that certainly by 65, most women are somewhere between less than five, because that's as low as most of the test lab, labs test at. So it says e their results says either less than five, or it says up to maybe about 39. So it's about as high as I've seen it. So when, when you take hormones, like as a supplement, they, they like to see your blood level in the morning to be at least like 50. Uh, so women are really quite a big range. And when I see somebody who's maybe having menopausal symptoms or not sleeping well or not thriving or feeling tired or feeling draggy or feel they've got brain fog and they're doing a lot of good things for themselves with their diet and lifestyle, they really shouldn't be dragging so much. Then And their, their estrogen dial is net less than five or it's seven or something. It's like really low. And then I, I might suggest, you know, maybe we can, we should try some hormones and especially if they're on the younger side, like within 10 years of, of menopause, that's a, a particularly like a window where the body seems to respond pretty um, consistently in a positive way to that. Mm -hmm. So we may try it. And if women say, I, I mean, I do find a lot of women say, oh, I have so much more energy. I just feel better. I feel more like myself. Um, those are signs to me that we're not overdosing sure. and watch the blood level. And I, if they feel great and their blood level is 20, I'm happy with that. I don't need everyone to be 50 or hundred or 150, you know? Sure. sure. So, the, so the answer regarding hormones is um, really, it, it just really depends on the situation. Yes. And if somebody is, tells me, you know, that no symptoms, they sleep great and everything and their, their hormone level is 25 or something like that. I say, you probably have plenty for your brain. You know, you don't have any symptoms and you have a decent level for a postmenopausal woman. So I, uh, I don't want to add, you know, hormones where maybe the body doesn't need it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and hopefully there'll be more research done, you know, over the next 10, 20 years, but we can't really count on them, you know, finding these fine gradations of, of balance, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. that would be nice, right? But we can um, do it clinically. Yes. Last but not least, month seven is toxins. And I mean, toxins in the environment are unavoidable. Um, so the relationship between toxins and brain health. Yeah, there's certainly there's a well established um, connection between certain heavy metals and cognitive function, even in children like lead levels that are higher than uh, other other children, those children have lower IQs. 
Mm -hmm. So there was an article published in the Journal of American Medical Association some years back that was entitled, No Lead is Good Lead. (laughs) You know, like you can't get it too low. It's like zero is the best because any degree above zero does is associated with less cognitive ability, even in children. So the same goes, you know, the aging brain, I won't say it's like a child brain, very different, but it may be a little more sensitive to um, toxins than maybe a middle-aged brain, you know, sort of like children, their, their, their bodies are a little more sensitive to toxic influences. So yeah, we wanna look at heavy metals. We wanna look at um, sources of inflammation, including the mold. If people have any evidence of a moldy environment, a musty smell in their house, uh, old carpet, um, they have a history of a water leak that they kind of fixed, but maybe they didn't totally, or it, when it rains in their basement, they get a little water. All these things can uh, cause brain problems. Mm. I have one patient who is uh, an aeronautical engineer, really, really, really smart, You know, works for NASA. And she started having all sorts of like dizziness and difficulty focusing and issues. And after about a year, I kept saying, you know, it seems like you're exposed to a toxin. And we kept, we kept racking our brains trying to figure out what could it be. And then uh, she had a backup of a sink in her, in her kitchen and she called the plumber and the plumber called her and said, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but it's not just your sink. You've got a problem all the way up the wall. In fact, you've had a leak from the bathtub above into your wall. And when they pulled the wall out, it was filled with black mold. So her bedroom was right by that bathroom. So she and her youngest son were having chronic sinus problems along with all these other things. Mm -hmm. And it took her another year or two of all sorts of natural detox things. And some, you know, she just had a lot of different natural therapies including the Ayurveda that we did together. Mm-hmm. And she recovered everything, her ability to focus on everything, but it took some time. Wow. But, wow. but it's, it's like, you just don't, you don't know unless you look. Yeah, this is the, this is part of the 36 holes. Um, is there, you, you have an order to this in terms of um, looking at uh, women's brain health and even men's brain health. Is there a reason why toxins are the last month? Um, no. Are, yeah. they, are they least like, is it least likely that toxins will be a factor versus some of the earlier ones that you looked at in earlier months? Or is there any, any particular reason for the order? Yeah. Cause I think like if somebody um, isn't changing their diet, they, yeah. can, they can do anything they want with their sure. mold, the toxins, but they'll probably still not <laughs> feel their best. So I like right. to start with what's kind of universally applicable. And if somebody already has mm-hmm. a great diet and they're eating a whole foods diet, they'll They'll flip through that chapter and say, yeah, got it, got it, got it. I've got that covered. You know, I do that. Sure. So the next chapter. So. so you start with the most critical. Um, you start with the most important, really. There are the ones that are, are probably the biggest culprits, and then you work from there. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. Um, I know that in addition to um, your book, which is The Healthy Brain Solution for Women Over 40, uh, you have a number of other books. Uh, some of them are going back a ways, but I'm just going to just take a moment and read the title of those books. Um, in 1993, you published a book, a, Women, a Woman's Best Medicine, Health, Happiness, and Long Life Through Ayurveda. Um, I did have an opportunity to look at that, and that's a lovely book. Uh, you were a co-author in that book. In um, 2002, you wrote a book, A Woman's Best Medicine for Menopause, Your Personal Guide to Radiant Health Using Maharishi Ayurveda. And in 2004, The Ageless Woman, Natural Health and Beauty After 40 with Maharishi Ayurveda. Um, Based on these titles and and what you described in terms of uh, your professional interests and career, um, you really focused on women's health, it appears. Um, and I'm wondering in terms of, you know, the duration of your career, how, you know, in looking at, like in 2002, you wrote a book about, um, a woman's best medicine, medicine for menopause, your personal guide to radiant health using Maharishi Ayurveda. How has your, 
vision progressed and evolved to you know where you are today and what you're embracing today? What's changed over the years? You know, that's a great question, Noreen. Yeah. Um, I think that you know the concept of individuality and the concept of you know. I'm just kind of open to everything natural and balanced and even thing, you know, the the hormones now are natural. They're bioidentical. I think that my, mm, what I wrote in around 2000, just before the women's health initiative came out, I was writing a book to provide natural approaches that were non-hormonal. Yes. The only thing being pushed on women for menopause was menopause Mm -hmm. is abnormal. It's a lack of ovarian hormone. You got to take hormone. Just like if your thyroid isn't making hormone, you give thyroid hormone. And, and I felt that that just, it didn't resonate with me that, you know, the body somehow in its wisdom and intelligence was designed to fall apart with the change in hormones. Like that didn't make sense to me. And, and Ayurveda tells us that we are designed to thrive and live 120 years in good health. So that includes menopause. So I, right. I, it's going to, yeah. it's, it's, that's going to happen somewhere in there. Yes. So I, I dive deep with the Ayurvedic physicians that I worked with and my mentors. And we, you know, we pulled out all the Ayurvedic principles and, and, and created a guide that women can use that's very individualizable with a, a special customized tea that women can take a test and say, well, here's the area of my, tissues and my metabolism that I love that by the way the wise tea you called it yeah that is wonderful well I love CCF tea but I love the customizations that you provided yeah well thank you so women you know the first time I've seen that yeah they can find what uh you know where their weak areas are for them Mm -hmm. and they can put the the right herbs and spices in to to address those and strengthen their own so so that was, and but I think that I, um, since the, especially since uh, looking at the last 20 years of refinement of research on the Women's Health Initiative, which found that, okay, using, you know, horse urine hormones and fake progesterone is damaging. It increases strokes and heart attacks and blood clots and breast cancer and all that. Well, that was a lot because of certain complications that I talk about in my book, like, you know, they, they didn't match the body's hormones or, um, they were estrogen was given by mouth. Then it goes through the liver and it increases clotting factors. So today we have other options as women, you know, you can take hormones through the skin, rubbing them in or as a patch and there are hormones that exactly match our human hormones. And there are many different doses, so you can really tailor it to the person and their needs. And I say that's that's a lot more natural. And I, some women, as I said, they they may be hormonally deprived. Those who have like measurable estrogen, and they might be having dry hair or skin, and their you know hair is falling out, and their skin's aging prematurely, and they don't sleep, and they have no energy. Well, maybe they need a little bit, but those women who have 29, maybe they're doing fine. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that the research is showing that actually taking hormones, especially in the first 10 years after menopause, might may help to reduce heart disease and brain, uh, you know, deterioration later in life. Sure. So okay. I think that you know some women might need that help to ease through the menopause and not get their brain stressed out from extreme hot flashes and lack of sleep and mood swings. Yeah. You know, so if if Ayurveda doesn't work, that's, that's my approach. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a broader approach. It sounds like that's where you are today. Yeah. Like I look at all the tools and yeah, you're, you're, you're considering all tools and um, I don't know where I heard this, but someone said anything that heals is Ayurvedic. Um, I don't know who I heard say that, or I don't even know if it's correct, but I did hear that. So I think Ayurveda says that. <laughs> Maybe it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that when you and I spoke before this interview today, um, you really want to emphasize in this interview and encourage women, younger women. So even though we're looking at that critical de- decade for women's cognitive health, um, between 45 and 55, your book 
uses the, the, the age 40. Um, now, many women at age 40, they, they still have young children at home. They're, you know, they're in the pitta time of life. They're highly driven. Uh, many, I mean, I'm generalizing, of course. Uh, they're extremely busy. Uh, they're probably not thinking that much about, um, unless they've tested positive for the, um, you know, they've tested positive for the Alzheimer's gene, which isn't a, de isn't a determinant either. It's, you know, but the issue is how do you reach women with this important, younger women, women who are 40, with this important information and how do you emphasize um, that the earlier they start thinking about this, the greater likelihood of aging gracefully um, and living a, a really productive, meaningful life into the future decades, you know, um, cause that really is the crux, you know, the, the tools are here now with um, what Dale Bredesen says that Alzheimer's is, will be, is eradicated in the 21st century, um, dementia. So what are your thoughts regarding that? Because really that's, that's the important issue. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's kind of a broader thing for women. Uh, first, let me just confirm what you said. And the research, for example, on sleep is that the, the people who get the least sleep today are women in that midlife age group. And they are, you know, the most stressed and most demands and they're getting the least sleep. So that that alone really in increases their risk of, you know, brain strain at this that time of life and later. Um, but I think that women have, a, you know, it's never been more challenging because women still, the research says, carry, you know, two thirds of the domestic responsibilities. Uh, in a household, and yet almost all women are working full time, and and you know, so you got you got two wage earners, but you know, the, taking care of the kids, uh, cooking for the kids, or the family as a whole. Yeah, it's it's. I, I'm not sure if balance enters into the equation. Yeah, it's sort of survival and, and you know, <laughs> getting through the day. Yeah, and I, I don't know what to say about that, but I think that if women at least begin to embrace and learn and and do a little bit here and there you know they can work little changes in one at a sure, time sure. and this is the time to do it right you know. the earlier the, really the earlier the better yeah. um so it's if you were to encourage women at age 40 to catch a healthy habit and and i know five, i'm just going to pick out five habits um, just because maybe we'll, we'll have the, the, be a possibility we'll remember them. Um, obviously, probably much more, but if they could start with five healthy habits, five really critical things to incorporate in their lives, what would they be? Um, well, if you want to make your digestion better and overall uh, help your body cleanse, I would say... Know, drink boiled hot water throughout the day. So, <laughs> you know, so like quality water. Drink but get warm. Drink warm water instead of cold water. Yeah, exactly. Cold okay. That, that's an easy one. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, why yeah. I brought it up first. Almost yeah. everyone can do it, and people say they they even within days. I've had women in programs that I've led, group programs that said oh my God, I haven't had a period in a year and a half. I'm overweight and my hormones have been the toast of press. They say, I got a period, like the second <laughs> day of drinking hot water, like, uh, or my periods, you know, came and it hasn't come or, or it's now coming normal. And it was also, you know, kind of like half there and half not there. And now it's sure. like a small flow. So, okay. you know, it's, it can be really profound. It can yeah. help elimination and wonderful. Well, I like the simplicity. So that's one. That's one. Um, I say second one would be to go to bed earlier, you know, to, to not, to get out of the habit of making after the kids go to bed, you know, from eight. Okay. You can have them eight till 10. I'll give you that, but get sure. the kids to bed early, but get yourself to bed early because when you stay up till 12, one o'clock, 
the quality of your sleep and the amount of time in deep sleep is not the same. Right. You do not get the same rejuvenation and yes. just start accumulating also that metabolic waste because you're not sleeping when your body wants to use that energy to cleanse. Right. But go to bed early by 10 o'clock. Ayurveda gives us that guideline. Work and on then, 10 o'clock. Yeah. And then another thing is to have a good lunch. And that should be the main meal of the day. So I know you're saying, oh, well, I work and I come home and I cook our main meal. Well, that's okay. But uh, it's transformative. It can be really transformative to cook two or three types of vegetables or do a stir fry for yourself. Bring that with something. Maybe it's lentils if you're vegetarian uh, and maybe some, you know, some kind of other source of protein if you're not and have that for your lunch. Have at least like a couple cups, a couple cups of cooked vegetables, fresh, that you've made at home, put sure. it in a the thermos, bring yeah. it to work. So it can be simple, but really work on transitioning out of that eating heavy foods or yeah. eating uh, your largest sandwich, meal. The cheese sandwich or the peanut butter sandwich or whatever, a big salad that can cause a lot of gas and bloating in some women. You think that salads are healthy for you and some women can do them and a lot of women don't do well with big salads all the time yeah but really have a cold hot uh, hot cooked fresh vegetables having a couple cups of those at lunch with something some other like cooked lentils or something sure that is so nourishing you will feel so calm settled and satisfied and then when you come home the likelihood that you're going to just start binging because you're kind of yeah you're you won't you won't have that snack attack yeah snack attack <laughs> Uh, all right. So that's three, uh, four, I would have to say meditate, meditate, uh, yeah. you know, whatever you call meditation, that's a good place to start. Right. But I would, I would encourage everyone to look at transcendental meditation. Sure. Because it has such a profound effect on the body as well as the mind. You have a very deep rest. Yeah. And even if you do other meditation, you do your Buddhist, you do chanting. If you do mindfulness, if you do whatever it is, mm -hmm. Christian meditation, that's fine to continue to do. TM I, is it's like a psychophysiological deep relaxation technique that is so effortless, easy, and it works from the start. Um, or you could go to tm.org and sure. just watch some of the videos. So really that. just having that, that tool for um, managing stress. Yeah, and, and rejuvenating from within. Right. It's yeah. quite exactly. quite profound how yeah. you create more silence and peace in your mind throughout the day. Absolutely. Okay, that's four. Okay, five. Let's do exercise. <laughs> so let's let's do a fun one. Um, ideally, a morning walk. Uh, yeah, I, I think I love a morning walk. Yeah, it's so rejuvenating. If you can get out even for 15, 20 minutes, remember 20 minutes is the, the Northwestern University study show that 20 minutes of morning light activity. And you, so you really, by getting the morning light, you get the vitamin D, you got the freshness, you get the OGES. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the sun, Ayurveda says the sun is the most nourishing and auspicious influence in all of nature. So yeah, that's, that's, those are great. Those are really wonderful. Well, this has been, um, well, just the women, the 40 year old woman who it's not on her radar yet. Um, I know that um, Dr. Keith Wallace at, at Maharishi University, um, and along with his son, or, uh, they have a course called Total Brain Coaching. I believe he has a book by the same name. And part of that program is how to change your habits. So I'm thinking that there might be something with that particular program and um, really reaching women who are 40 or approaching 40 with um, adopting healthier habits that are really going to shift toward um, uh, maintaining their brain coherence into into the decades to come. So just, just a thought there, I was thinking about that. Yeah, that's um, a beautiful point. In transcendental meditation, I, you know, I've recommended it to so many of my patients, thousands of them have learned over these decades. And um, they often just tell me that 
they just found that certain things that they were kind of addicted to, they say, I, it just doesn't appeal to me anymore. So yeah, yeah, like, that's, that's actually a, a, I think that's an excellent point regarding meditation, those unhealthy things can start to fall away. And that's the greatest because that's, that's effortless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you don't want to, you don't want to be white knuckling giving up um, habits that are um, ingrained for years. Let me just take um, one last thing. Yeah, sure. I asked about changing habits and doing things little by little. It makes me think about, uh, I made some quizzes on my website and I have two uh, quizzes that are very popular. And one is a stress type. Like you find out your stress type, according to Ayurveda, there are three types, like how people react to stress, like either they worry and get anxious or they get irritable and angry or they get depressed and kind of withdrawn. And you take this quiz and then you get a tip each week for six weeks. Oh, that's great. That, that you can incorporate that will balance you. I like that. And I also have one on digestion, which will tell you about Vata, you know, Pitta or Kapha, the three types of okay. digestion balance, and it will give you a tip a week. Oh, that's great. And, and they'll see that. Will they see that on your, um, the healthy brain or Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf website? Yeah, they go to uh, Dr. Lonsdorf, or if you can't spell my name, just Dr. for Dr. Nancy Health. Okay, uh, Dr. Nancy Health, and um, actually, and then, that's I, great because they'll get a reminder of a healthy, a healthy tip, um, both for digestive and um, brain health. Exactly. Or you know, anxiety, worry, how they react to stress. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I know that I want to, I'm just looking for something here, of course, okay, a second, oh, um, I don't know if you've seen Dean Ornish's new book called Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases, but I know um, it's research on that, and, and what yeah. is that, prostate cancer, and for heart disease, so yeah, yeah I mean, like very encouraging, you know, the whole yeah. idea of epigenetics. And I like that title, Undo It, because okay. to me, that also relates to um, TM or, you know, whether you're using TM or another meditative technique or other stress relieving that um, we don't have to be so wedded to our unhealthy habits. We can undo them. So um, I just want to end by... Uh, reading, um, I believe this was on your website, a testimonial from a patient. Uh, and this is Jeff Jenkins, who wrote the book, The Steambird's Descent, Tracing the Steambird's Descent. Thank you for the right methods to break through the mental wall in my head. Only was I able to reclaim the keys to momentum to open and reopen my heart and mind. Above all, you've guided me to cultivate the essence for body, mind, heart, and soul. With wonder and wellness, Jeff Jenkins. So that's- Yeah, it was very beautiful. Um, uh, one of my patients who was suffering quite, quite strongly from Alzheimer's and a bit down because of the limitations it created for me. He's a writer. He was a professor in teaching literature and he hadn't been able to write and he was kind of withdrawn and because it was difficult for him to interact with people and through this program uh, he and his wife really applied themselves to integrate all the different recommendations and he recovered to the point where he goes to the recreation center he gets invited to go fishing with some of the guys and he he said it was difficult for him to learn yoga because he couldn't remember or follow at first but he mm. kept with it and he said the yoga really helped him and his brain to recover, which is similar to patient zero. And, um, and he just started to remember timelines, like what had happened the day before. And, and his wife said it, it just made a really big difference. And he, he gifted me his book of poetry. <laughs> and, uh, he wrote that beautiful inscription and his wife. That is, that is really, uh, that, that's very, very touching. Yeah, his yeah. wife said, you know, he couldn't have done that a year ago. That's awesome. Wrote it that, himself, so. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. And you also had the following quote on your, on your website. A physician is obligated to consider more than a diseased organ, 
more even than the whole man, he must view the man in his world. A quote by Harvey Cushing, MD. Um, I think that really says it all. It's more than holistic. It's, it's um, maybe worldistic. I don't know. So yeah, thank you for that. So I just want to thank you, Nancy, Dr. Lonsdorf for joining us today uh, at the Healthy Peaceful Podcast. And um, in terms of where viewers and listeners can find you, your website, you have a couple of different websites. Do you want to, and I'll include all of this in the show notes, but Okay. Um, why, why don't you just tell, uh, if you want to just indicate where people can find you now, drnancylonsdorf.com. That will get you there. And Dr. Nancy Hell will get you there, Dr. Nancy Hell. Sure. And um, you can get to everything else through there, to my books on Amazon, as well as uh, there are interviews. I have an interview with Dr. Bredesen that he, I ask him many interesting questions that he gave fantastic answers to and sure. um, there's also a quiz that you can take a quiz to test your kind of test out your lifestyle for your brain health and see where you're at risk and it will tell you you know what areas you need to put more attention on okay and is that on the healthybrain.com no that's on do that's dr nancy health yeah okay. dr. Nancy health is kind of the, the that's the that's the, the main one page. yeah awesome and all my quizzes are on there and um, my ageless brain is the the course that people can take. Okay, and that's also that's the website. My ageless yeah, brain. Yeah, that's that's the separate. Okay, all right, great. And I'll have all of that detail. So, thank you again, Dr. Lonsdorf, and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. All right. Well, bye bye. Bye bye.